And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Sean from the Our Collective Experiences YouTube channel. After Sean's near-death experience, he came back with a message that this was his last chance. Sean, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thanks, Jeff. Nice to, uh, nice to be here. Well, we are excited to have you. And if you don't mind, Sean, let's just start on the day you died and go from there. Uh, sure. So I, uh, I had been having a really, really long slide into the worst part of my life at that point. Um, I had just lost my business. Uh, we were uh, getting sued by ex uh, uh, clients. It was just like it was a terrible time. Uh, we had pretty much lost everything. And uh, my wife and my two kids, we had to leave our rental that we had. And we had to move back into a two bedroom condo. Uh, so we were going from a fairly large house down into a tiny little condo that we had to squeeze into. And I was exhausted because I had to uh, finish renovating it on like a shoestring budget. And so I was, I was working full time and I was renovating at the same time. And uh, it was terrible. It was a terrible time. And I, at that point, I was super atheistic, um, materialistic. Uh, I was egotistical. And I had a couple things left to do for the uh to be able to move out of our rental so all i had to do was do a couple touch-ups and so i went downstairs into the basement and there was this five gallon pail of paint that the builders had left and there was this pull top and i ended up uh it was stuck and so i was pulling 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 it wouldn't come off and I should have ran upstairs and grabbed my screwdriver, but I was like, ah, screw that. And instead, I used my pocket knife, and I was holding it with one hand, and I was popping it, trying to pop it with the other, and I was super tired. And all of a sudden, it went, it popped all right, and it ended up right into right here. This is from the surgeon. Uh, but it ended up going right here and nicking my artery. And uh, because it nicked, uh, it wouldn't close. And... Uh, Instantly, I uh, my knife got there was so much pressure, like it had gone all the way through almost, and it popped right out onto the floor and it started gushing blood like instantly. And so I slammed my hand on it, trying to stop the the blood. And I I'm a paramedic, so I I was thinking uh, I was like, well, it shouldn't be too bad. Like I don't think I hit the artery, but I'm not sure. And so I quickly ran upstairs. I ran outside and I was yelling at my wife at the time, yelling for her to call 911. And uh, she comes running out and I didn't get any drops of blood on the main floor. So that was nice. And I uh, came running out the, uh, the door onto the garage pad and towards the car. And I hear her yelling at me. Uh, she's like, we can't. She's like, I'm not driving you. She's like, there's no way I'm driving you. And I go, why? And I turn around and it looked like a, an elk got, had got shot. Like it was, it was, I didn't realize how fast um, I was losing blood. And so, so she decided to call 911. I came back and I dropped my tailgate on my truck and I was leaning on it and it started filling all the gaps in the tailgate. And, and I started getting woozier and woozier. And I was thinking, okay, I better, I better put on a tourniquet. And for some reason, uh, she said, okay, he's going to put on a tourniquet. 911, for some reason, said, no, don't put on a tourniquet, which was super weird. But I was so, like, I was losing blood so fast, I was out of it. Uh, so I didn't argue. And uh, I had been pushing so hard that my muscles ended up snapping. And it ended up, half of it ended up going into my wrist. And then the other half ended up going into my shoulder. And I, uh, I leaned up against the garage pad and I was starting to fade out. And I, I, I remember, I remember this one joke that I was thinking in my head and I was like, well, I finally get across one thing off my bucket list, which is stabbing a <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so I, uh, I started fading and fading and, uh, my wife was panicking. Uh, she did pretty good for it at the time. And, uh, and it, 
I leaned over and I got her to drag over my uh, kid's wagon and I put myself in the recovery position and she had given me a, a rag by that time and I started pushing it up, uh, pushing and leaning down and holding my arm there. And then I started getting um, this white started coming slowly from the edges of my vision slowly started coming in until it was super like it was almost all white and uh, i felt this i could feel like everything seemed like super intense like the smells were super intense uh the heat from the sun was like really intense and then the next thing i know i'm staring at somebody on the ground and it, there's blood all around him and i remember thinking as like wow that guy does not look good like he doesn't look in good shape at all and uh and then it's then it dawned on me that's not somebody else that's me and uh, as soon as i realized it was me i got shot off almost like a rocket uh, kind of like uh i don't know if anybody's ever had like a dmt experience or something but that rocketing uh where you get rocketed i got rocketed straight up and then i was in this blackness and there was this tiny white little light and this light started coming closer and closer and closer and uh, until it was like huge and it was covering my entire vision. It was almost like a solar eclipse. And what it looked like is if you took like a drop of white ink and dropped it on a black piece of paper, that's kind of what it looked like. It was like all like edges and sh shattered all over the place and it was moving. And I could feel other things kind of going towards it but i couldn't see anything else it fe felt like it was just me there and um it kind of reminds me of uh the movie soul uh when that one scene where everybody's going towards this this tunnel almost and i started getting drawn closer and closer as it was coming towards me until i was like really close like i don't know like 10 feet away and then all of a sudden it seemed like it, it instantly disappeared and i was in this really beautiful meadow and I had long green yellow grass and <laughs> beautiful butterflies of like different colors of blues and and uh pinks and stuff and then there was flowers everywhere and I was thinking I was I remember thinking I was like this seems really really uh stereotypical and that's why I remember because I was I was really like I didn't believe in any of that stuff at the time and and I was thinking, I was like, this just seems way too much. And there was this tree, just this lone tree beside this like babbling brook. And I, and I was, I was thinking, man, this is just crazy. And then all of a sudden this harp music started playing. And I was like, okay, this is really, <laughs> this is like way too on the nose. And so this harp music started playing and it's the, it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard. Um, it was but I, I wish I was a music, musician um, to reproduce it because it was beautiful. And I've never heard something like it again. Um, and then and then I felt uh, this presence around me. Couldn't see anything, but I felt this this presence of like a group or maybe one. I'm not sure. And they started speaking to me, uh, but not vocally. It was like telepathically. And uh, in a language I didn't under I didn't know, but I like I understood them, uh, if that makes sense. And uh, they said that I have a choice that I can go back, or I can stay here with them. And at that moment, I was like, well, why would I? Why would I go back? It's uh, it's beautiful here. Like it was, it was the most beautiful place I had ever felt or seen. Um, and it felt like uh, these beings loved me like. In, like way more than I've ever felt before. And so I was already, I was, uh, I'd already made my decision. I was like, I'm, I'm staying, <laughs> I'm not going back. And they said, well, before you make your decision, we're going to show you something. And so they brought me, then I got instantly moved to this library, which I think maybe is like a, maybe the Akashic record going for, or the Akashic library now, after been looking into a lot of this stuff. At the time, I had no idea. It was just this giant library, um, bigger than uh, St. Peter's Basilica in, in uh, uh, Italy. It was massive, like, and it's just floor to ceiling of all these books with lit torches, and these books were mat like 
probably about this big and really thick with leather bound uh leather bound uh spines and you could smell like the ancientness of it almost and they started leading me down this hallway and it seemed to stretch forever and then off to the side there was this other room and i got led into there but again i i don't remember seeing anyone i just knew i was being led um and i got led into this room and in this room there was this dais uh like this table sink this table with a single leg <clears throat> and on it was a dome and i got led into the led to go look at this dome and i don't remember the details but i remember the feeling of it and the, what i saw was all my different choices uh that it looked like a tree and so there was the tree roots that led uh, there's multiple choices of how to get to this one uh, choice, and that was the tree trunk. And then from that that event that has to happen, it branches out into millions of different other choices that will eventually lead back to roots and eventually back to a tree trunk. And uh, and then I was shown not just my past but my future, which I'm I'm not I. Wasn't I guess I'm not I wasn't allowed to remember it because I don't, but it obviously affected my choice. And uh, and as I was looking at it, I had this feeling that um, that's not always going to be like as depressing as it was. That's eventually going to go better, and I'm going to be able to uh, eventually have a better life. And then uh, they said, uh, so, and then after I had a chance to look at this, uh, they told me that um, so I can make the choice now, I can either go back or I can stay here or I go back, but it's my last chance. And then I woke up uh, to a paramedic uh, yelling at me to, to wake up and they put a tourniquet on me. Um, they got me into the ambulance and put an IV in me and I end up having a, a 35 over 45 blood pressure. So I'd lost a lot. And uh, I had done a trauma course a little couple months later and uh, the chances of survival were under 5%. So yeah. And they said the, when I got to the hospital, they, they surprisingly didn't give me a blood transfusion because I bounced back so fast with just IV. Uh, like saline solution, and uh, which is really odd because usually you get blood transfusion. So there's a, quite a few little oddities along the way. And then, uh, yeah, I ended up making a, a full recovery. It took me about seven months to be able to be able to fully use my arm again. Sean, thank you for sharing your experience. You mentioned that the language that these beings spoke wasn't something that you knew but you mm -hmm. understood them. Mm -hmm. If you can remember the language, does it sound like an earthly language, like Spanish or French or something? It's hard to remember. That's one of the parts that is really hard to remember. I just know that it wasn't a language I knew. Um, like, I don't even remember. It was like it got instantly translated, almost instantly in my head. But I knew that they weren't speaking English, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. You also mentioned that you were an atheist prior to mm -hmm. this. What mm -hmm. are your spiritual beliefs now? Uh it's been quite a it's been quite a journey. So that that was in 2020 and I'd say now I'm uh I'm highly spiritual. I'm pretty much gearing towards like omnism which is like a belief that uh not not just one religion but all religions have uh, key pieces to how this uh, universe works and uh right now i i find uh there's been a lot of synchronicities in my life and uh the more work i do on myself the more it reflects on like the outer world and i believe in there there's definitely a, a universal power i'm not sure if it's a god or um the universe itself but i yeah i definitely believe in something now have you noticed that after your experience, you have new abilities that you didn't have prior? Uh, yeah. Uh, so before, 
Um, I was highly uh, locked up emotionally. Um, didn't really, uh, wasn't very, I couldn't communicate very well with uh, emotions or really anything. I was always funny, but that was about it. Uh, but now um, I can really, like a high, high, high degree, like empath, I can really feel people now. Um, and it seems to, it seems to help like with my life mostly. It's like, uh, I'm way more, uh, intuitive as well. Um, and especially with the empath, I like, guess really helped with, uh, my overall life because, uh, I'll notice it's, it's almost like a magnifying glass on a person. I can, you can notice, uh, subtle things now which I was oblivious to before. Um, so like, and I can feel a, a mood in a room now, which I never could before either. Um, it's, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. It's been, it was really hard though. Cause it was a, when it first started, like right after the NDE, um, it was like overwhelming because I'd have this feeling like, like I work with a coworker that would get angry, like super fast. And then all of a sudden I would get super angry and I, I, I'd be sitting there and not understanding why I was angry. And it took me months to figure out, well, maybe it wasn't me because <laughs> it would be, oh, I'd be just doing my normal thing being a crane operator at the time. And, and all of a sudden I just get this wave of anger and I didn't know where it was coming from. And like, it was overwhelming. And then, and then I'd, my, I'd see my coworker like throwing things or something. And, uh, and then it, yeah, it took months to figure it out though. It seems to me that during the initial part of your NDE, when you were headed toward the light and you were in the meadow, it seemed like it was something that was stereotypical for you or something that you expected. Do I've you never think you thought about that? <laughs> yeah. Do you think that you created that environment since you expected it? <laughs> That's a tough question, actually. I'm not sure. I would. I've never actually thought about that. If I, uh, if re if I re really created it, yeah. Because yeah, you're right. It's like super stereotypical, and it almost is like, you know, what it almost feels like. I guess thinking about this now is that uh, it's like I was shown something that was so stereotypical. I wouldn't be able just to like wipe it away and say, oh, whatever this was. Um, because it was, it wasn't like crazy, like a dream or anything. It was like, this is what you'd expect. And so then that made me really, that made me really think about it a lot more, I think, than if it was something um, like uh, I heard about this one where this person was riding whales. Uh, uh, through, like, I think that wouldn't, I would have dismissed a lot easier to, to be honest. So maybe that was why. So are you saying that then you were supposed to remember elements of this? I think so. I have this feeling I was uh, allowed to remember it um, maybe as motivation to change because I end up changing my my whole life is about is like a 180. Like my life uh, compared to four years ago compared to now is like 100% different. If you don't mind commenting, can you share with us what needed to change in your life? Uh, pretty much, pretty much everything. Um, I end up getting uh, divorced, uh, and um, because we didn't have a very good relationship, uh, it was just it was like limping along. Um, we had grown way too far apart, uh, and we didn't have uh, we both came we both didn't have very good communication skills, um, and then it had been the status quo for so long that it was hard we couldn't come back, if you know what I mean. And uh, I end up uh, changing jobs, um, changing uh, how I live my life. Uh, so I, I don't drink. I hardly ever drink now. Um, uh, I used to, I was smoking weed at the time. I don't do that anymore. Um, I was really materialistic. So I was always trying to find something to, like that hole inside your your soul or your heart you were always i was always trying to fill that with something material instead of looking at the what the root cause was and maybe seeing that there was something that i needed to work on 
Um, I ended up doing a ton of shadow work. Uh, well, and that's ongoing, of course. Like, it never seems to end. Sorry to interrupt you, but what is shadow work? Uh, so it is Carl Jung's... Um, uh, how would I say this? Carl Jung came up with this uh, belief that uh, shadow. everyone has a shadow uh, of their own personalities, parts that they don't want, they've either shunned or as like a protection mechanism or parts that uh, they can't see. And shadow work is all about illuminating the shadow parts of yourself that you're either ashamed of or don't want to look at. And then typically, uh, typically what his uh, theories were and um, thoughts on it were that if there's something in a person that you don't like, a lot of times it's part of your shadow. And so that's how uh, I, I view things now. So if there's something that... Uh, I try to. I'm not perfect. I still get mad in traffic. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I try to explore those different aspects of myself. And the more I, sh I explore and light the shadow within myself, uh, the less burden I feel and the easier it is to like love others and uh, love myself. And I ended up finding like the love of my life uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, yeah, like it's never been the same since. Do you feel that this experience has changed the way you work as a paramedic? Uh, so I don't, uh, I was never like, I was only on the, like the ambulance for um, a couple months while I was working as a crane operator. So I was essentially like a Band-Aid. Uh, but uh, I was involved with a whole bunch of like really serious uh, incidents here in, here in Calgary. And I had my uh, preceptor had noticed that I could uh, sense things, and this was before my NDE, uh, sense things about the patients, and I've found that now. So, like, uh, one example was uh, we were at a rollover, and the, the there was a couple kids and the mom uh, because they got T-boned, and the I was assigned as a, as a student to go uh, uh, to triage the one little girl. And so I was doing some, I was doing my palpitations. I was feeling, checking everything on her and there was something wrong with her abdomen. There was no actual physical signs because um, there was no distension. There was nothing. There was no, no physical signs that there should be anything wrong with that, with her abdomen. Uh, but I, I felt something and I, I was like, okay. So I put on a KED, which is this whole body. Um, it's essentially a bodysuit which immobilizes the spine. And I told the, uh, some other paramedics came in to take her to the children's hospital. And they said, uh, and I said to them, as we we're handing off, I said, there's something wrong with her abdomen on this side and this particular spot where the liver is. And I said, um, you should inform the, the doctors there that they should really look at that first. Not her, uh, don't worry about her spine so much, but look at her abdomen. And they went, okay. Uh, so they end up taking her and they end, he end up calling my uh, preceptor. And they said that, uh, that uh, she had had a lacerated liver, but because she was in a kid and they were worried about her C-spine, um, they would have never looked there until later. And they said, uh, and the thing with kids is that uh, they compensate really, really well until all of a sudden they, they dump and uh, she would have ended up dying. So they, uh, they said, because of that, um, they, she was able to make a full recovery. And so I, that one really sticks out to me um, because there was no signs and there should have been no indication of anything weird. She didn't have any like pain or anything there. Um, but that one sticks out to me. Has the memories of this experience faded over time? Uh, no, it's uh, crystal clear. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. If anything, they've gotten a little more clear. Um, but I, know, I haven't been able to remember anything more than, than that. Do you fear death at all? Uh, no, no, I don't fear death. I, uh, uh, I fear missing out on life. Actually, I don't fear it. I just, I try to live life uh, and be really grateful now. That took a long time. That took a long time to, to process and integrate. Um, but yeah, it, uh, yeah, I don't fear death because I know that there's much more to it 
and that this is only just one 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 pit stop along the way. Yeah. If you had a friend that was grieving over the loss of a loved one, what kind of advice would you give? Uh, two years ago, uh, my hunting partner, uh, one of my buddy's uh, uncles, uh, super close to him, uh, Wayne, he ended up uh, getting cancer. And uh, he was having a really, a, a real tough time with it. Uh, and so we, we had talked about my NDE before and everything. And he, he told, I told him about what my beliefs were and that, uh, like, from my perspective, like, this was only a temporary thing and I'd see him again and so would everybody else. Uh, and that, uh, that it's okay to, uh, cause he was really tired of fighting. Um, cause it was like, it was, it was a grueling one. It was super fast. And I said that he he was trying to hold on, but he didn't know how to like let go uh, because he was afraid that once he did that he would never never get to interact with anyone ever again. And uh, I, I I just told him what what I felt and what I believe now, and he it seemed to bring him comfort and. Uh, I was in Germany when he passed, and uh, I remember having a dream. Uh, so I had a dream while I was there. Sorry, this is a little tough. Um, I had a dream while I was there that uh, I was teaching my partner how to back up a trailer, uh, and Wayne Wayne's truck was there, and it was like Wayne, and he loved his truck, like loved it. And it was there watching, and I ended up like teaching her how to back it up perfectly. And uh, his lights came on, and I got this feeling like um, uh, it's time, it's time. And he turned around and drove off. Uh, and I woke up the, I woke up, and I texted my buddy, and I said, "Sorry for your loss." And he had no idea he had uh, he had literally just died, and. Uh, yeah, I, I think about that one a lot. Do you feel then that that was a, a contact dream? Like he was saying goodbye to you? I, I think so, yeah. Yeah, it felt like that to me. Uh, just because of the, the timing of it. Um, and the fact that he had literally just died when I texted him. Um, and it felt like he was saying goodbye, which was really nice. Because I wasn't able to be there because I was overseas. Yeah, so it it was for me. It was very comforting, and it was almost like, like a confirmation for myself that, yeah, this this is real. Do you believe in reincarnation as well? Uh, I'm starting to. Yeah, yeah. I never did. I, again, this is it's kind of weird because uh, if I think back before my NDE, like any of these questions, I would have been like, no, no there's no no friggin' way. Uh, now, yeah, yeah. I definitely think that we're. Um, we're almost uh, uh, infinitely spiritual being operating a, an avatar is how I see it. Mm -hmm. Well, before we started recording, you mentioned that you've also had ET contact experience. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So I didn't realize I was a, an experiencer. So I identify now as a, an experiencer. I'm part of the experiencer group on uh, online. Uh, which is run uh, is a group for people that have had uh, anomalous experiences, either with ghosts or uh, UFOs, ETs, uh, anything non-human intelligence, essentially. And uh, I didn't realize I was one until after the NDE. And I started having these really vivid uh, experiences. Um, my mom is an experiencer that had, she was, uh, in 1967, her and her um, siblings end up seeing a UFO land on the on our family farm, and uh, they end up having a, a bit of missing time, and uh, they end up running back. And my grandpa, who is an, also an experiencer, and his was in 1939, his first one, and all the way till the end, he uh, he went up there, and there was uh, three uh, burnt uh, patches in the field, like round circles in the in the wheat field and and then my grandma and my granny at the time had heard this uh and i the only way i can describe it because i've heard it too is the swooshing sound so if you can picture um 
if you can picture a whirlpool of air, of water, but of air. That's what it sounded like. And went over top of the farmhouse. And then, uh, and I had grown up with that story for years and years. And I was always kind of, I was always curious. So every time we'd go back, I'd, I'd ask about it. And I, I'd never thought anything of it. There was something like nagging me deep down, but I never really was able to, everything I just pushed down. I was just like a bottle, like just shoving as much down as I could, every emotion, everything, right? And uh, after the NDE, uh, then these memories started coming back. Um, and so the memory that I remember first, or and and the earliest was when I was four years old. And I woke up, uh, I had gone to bed, and then all of a sudden, the next thing I know, I'm in this green pool, uh, this pool that's filled with green, slimy, liquid and uh i'm it feels like i'm getting like drown like i'm drowning and so i'm swimming and treading treading water even though i don't really know how to swim that well and i'm able to get to the edge and i climb myself up and i'm in this really dark uh gray room and it almost looks like what a, a fairy tales dungeon would be except all the bricks are perfectly smooth and uh, there's all these other kids, and I'm naked, and there's all these other kids uh, in the corner, uh, and they're all screaming. <laughs> and so I I run straight over to them, and there's this little uh, there's this blonde girl a little, little bit taller than me, and I I grab her, so she grabs onto me, and uh, I ask them, uh, do you do you know uh, where my mom and dad are? Like, do, where are we? Um, sorry. Um, do you, uh, like, what's going on? And they're, they're all speaking different languages. Uh, so I don't understand them, uh, but they're all, like, really terrified, and, and so am I. And so we're, we're all in there screaming, and this room is large, it's rectangular, and the ceilings are high, and but you can't see the, the walls are high, but you can't see the ceiling, and because it's, like, lost in, like, the shadow. And then all of a sudden, at the far end of the room, uh, this doorway appears, uh, like instantly, and it's uh, pure white light coming out of it. And this lady walks out, uh, and this woman's like a tall blonde, um, essentially like like model, even more than model perfect, like almost fake looking. How perfect she looks, uh, but she has these really big, uh, big eyes that are uh, with the most insanely blue pupils. Uh, but they look, they're too big for like a normal face. Um, and she has like a perfect, like a perfect face that looks, it uh, looks perfectly loving and everything, um, but there's no emotion. So there's no, she has no emotion on her face. And uh, she looks completely naked, but there's no, no signs of any nakedness, if that it makes any sense. Like there's no outward signs, but she looks completely naked. And uh, so she starts walking over to us and she grabbed, and we're all, we had gone silent for a second. Then we all um, started yelling, like, can you help us? Can you help us? And screaming and some were crying and, and she walks up and she grabs a boy by the hand and his face instantly uh, just goes like completely uh, neutral. And it almost looked like, like a state of bliss fell over his face. And uh, she reaches, uh, grabs his hand, and she starts leading him out. And right then, where uh, I remember, just like this is way too much. Like this is, like I don't know what is going on. And like a four-year-old at the time just doesn't know how to process any of this. Um, and she leads him out into the doorway, and then the doorway disappears. And so we're left in there screaming. Um, I don't know if it was hours. It probably was only minutes. To me, it felt felt like hours uh, and then she'd come back and then she'd grab another kid again the same thing the kid would just go instantly uh, neutral look look like super happy um well emanating like he was happy i guess his face was just like deadpan and then get let out and then he, she'd grab a girl and a boy and, and finally it came down to my turn and i was thinking i was like well maybe i can try biting her or something 
and uh, as soon as she locked eyes on me, I just remember just feeling like, oh, I, I'm instantly loved. And then she reached out my hand and for my hand, and I reached out mine. And uh, I felt this overwhelming sense of love, and everything's okay. There's no need to worry. And she started leading me out. And we went out the doorway into this hallway. Um, that was, uh, it was like a, it was a hallway, almost like if you pictured a smooth, everything was, there's no hard 90 degrees or anything. And it was perfectly smooth and there was no lights, but all the walls and the floor and the ceiling that all merged together, it was emanating light. So almost like, uh, like a bioluminescent almost sort of thing. And it was a long hallway. Uh, it looked, uh, very similar to the white of my mom's corning ware. I remember thinking that it was that, you know, the corning ware, uh, porcelain dishes that everyone used to have in the, in the eighties. Okay. And, uh, and so I, uh, we were walking down and there was no shadows. That was the other thing I really remembered. Um, we were, so she was leading me down and I wanted to touch it. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't move. I was like locked just holding her hand and locked in place and just walking forward. I, all I could, I couldn't even really move my head. All I could move was my eyes. And I get led into this room that's perfectly white, the same color, same lighting. And it looks like the, if you were inside a, like a portobello mushroom cap. Uh, it's like, so it has that sloping walls. And on the left, there is a view screen, uh, the kind of like, um, Star Trek The Next Generation's view screen on the Enterprise. And there was, it was all black, but there was little dots of white and stuff. I'm not sure if I was underwater, if it was in space. I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, hard to tell. And then in the center was like a mushroom stem. So another single leg, kind of like my NDE. There's a lot of similarities between the, the two. And then there was a white plastic, what looked like plastic table. And she led me over to it and laid me, I, I got on it and laid down and I couldn't really move. And uh, I was staring at my toes and then I could sense that she was leaving. And I was like, and she, she I was kind of hurt that she didn't say goodbye or anything. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she left. And then I felt this uh, presence behind me. And I felt uh, saying that I remember feeling like getting told that this is this is normal. Uh, this has happened before. It's going to happen again. You've you've done this before, and that everything's fine. You don't need to worry. Um, you're loved. And then I felt these really long uh, fingers on my shoulder. It's hard to tell the scale because it's my memories of when I was four. So it's really hard to tell how long they were. Um, They're gray, and then I I like craned my eyes back as hard as I could because I still couldn't move my head. And all I saw was these big, big eyes uh, that were like uh, black and glistening, like they were wet uh, from the white light. And then that's the last thing I remember. How did these memories return to you? Like in a dream or during meditation? Uh, so I'd end up, uh, before this, I'd ended up uh, going for a hypnotherapy session. Um, to unlock, because I had uh, a bunch of Doge coins, uh, Doge coins that I needed uh, that I had forgotten the password, and I ended up doing a hypnotherapy session to try and unlock those. So it seems like a bunch of synchronicities to get to all the. If we, I, looking back, everything seems like it's been like a step by step by step by step. Um, but uh, yeah, I end up having a hypnotherapy session, which seemed to unlock something. So there's, I could feel. In my hypnotherapy session, I was led into my memories and I was able to go into like my basement of my house and watch myself do the password. I never did end up getting the password and I, I actually stopped thinking about it for the longest time. Um, but what I remember in the hypnotherapy session and uh, Wally, the hypnotherapist, really said it was a really weird one was that... Uh, um, that at the far edges of my memories inside that th hypnotherapy session, it was almost like a door opened 
And then I could feel the the terror and the and it felt overwhelming inside that session of like something's gonna like like there's something I buried long ago, but now the door's wide open. And uh, then a a little bit later, um, I end up having a dream and and I remember this is either uh, it feels different than a dream, I guess, as what I'm I, like it was a dream. Uh, but it feels different than a dream. Um, it feels, it felt like a memory, and it still does. And my brother also has uh, remembers um, me. He has a memory of me walking to a UFO uh, in the field. He has a memory of it, and uh, he's only talked about it once because he he we can't talk about this stuff. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, so uh, yeah. I, I think it's a memory, but it could have all been um, like a like a astral projection. I don't know. It's it's hard to tell without any physical evidence. Well, the being told you that you're going to have more experiences. Mm -hmm. Did you have any more? Yeah. So right after my NDE, we end up going hunting, um, and I've been struggling trying to figure out what the what the hell I was going to do with my life. And this was only a couple months after. And a couple of months before that, like a month after my NDE, we saw our first UFO, or what I thought was my first UFO. It was my conscious first conscious one I, that I could remember, um, with my daughter and my wife and other daughter, um, and it was an egg shaped UFO. Uh, it only lasted like thirty seconds, but it pretty much plunged me into the rabbit hole of trying to figure out <laughs> what what is reality and what is flying around here. Um, and then a couple of months later, uh, we ended up at my out hunting up way up north in northern Alberta, um, miles and miles and miles away from anybody. And uh, we were camping. I was camping in a tent uh, with my dad and everybody else was in trailers and Wayne was there. And we ended up having uh, going to sleep. We had quite a few wobbly pops, uh, like total disclosure. And um, I end up going to bed. And usually Wayne, the interesting part is usually Wayne wakes up three times a night. He was like religious. He had to wake up three times a night to go to the washroom. Um, like for the last 20 years, because he was 80 when he died. Uh, yeah. So like for 20 years, this, this is his normal process. So we go to bed and, and I wake up to uh, this whooping sound. And it was like, whoop, kind of like a howler monkey, but way bigger. And I can hear them coming in towards camp. And I remember I, I'm, I'm like, dad, I'm like, wake, the up. wake, wake up. Uh, sorry about swearing. Um, uh, wake, wake up. And uh, he won't wake up. And he, uh, and all of a sudden I, uh, again, this is the, like the sense thing. It's really weird. Uh, I can hear something, and I thought it was an airplane at first, but I can almost tell where it's coming from. Uh, like it's almost like giving me like a like I almost got a projection of a map on my like a overhead view of like the camp. And there's this what I thought was a plane, but there's usually never planes that fly there. Uh, it's not in the flight path. But I hear this swooshing sound. So it's the same one that my uh, grandpa uh, described it to. And the swooshing sound comes over. And it comes right over the tent and all that whooping stops and I can hear them like leaving. And this swooshing sound is right over top of the tent and I'm looking up and then uh, I black out. And then all I remember is glimpses of uh, me walking out of the tent in my boxers. It was minus 40. I was walking on in the snow and there's this wide opening, um, probably, probably. 200 yards wide and there's this silver craft uh like kind of pretty typical i guess of a what, a what you would think a typical ufo is like perfectly silver and hovering about this high off the ground and there was this uh walkway coming straight down and there was two little uh two little grays standing there waiting for me and i remember walking up to them and, that, and that's the last thing i remember
Have you considered going back to the hypnotherapist to see if you can recover those memories? Uh, I did go back to a hypnotherapist, but it didn't feel like it was the right time or that I even needed to. Uh, so I ended up doing as um, a, a journey, like a, almost like a shamanic journey instead, to because I felt like there was, and this was in August, that I felt like I needed uh, some guidance or or some. Uh, I need some answers. I felt like there's something I needed to do. Uh, so I end up doing this, uh, this journey, uh, with somebody who's, uh, in the experiencer group and, uh, she led me, she put me into a hip, uh, hypnotized state and I end up, um, laying, I was laying on the bed and I remember thinking it was all black. And so I was in the, and I was telling her, I was like, it's all black. And she's like, well, just, She's like, stop trying to think about it. Just let things happen. And so all of a sudden, then I started feeling, uh, I started seeing sand start filling the area. And I was, I was sitting on sand and then a palm tree. And then I saw the pyramids. And, uh, and she, then she asked me, is, uh, is anyone around you? And I looked over and I could see this um, brown leg with this white, almost like tunic. And I started going up and the whole, uh, his body started filling in. I could see his body. And then I got up to the, the head and I'm, I was terrified of birds up till about a year ago where I had a whole bunch of birds surround me and my dad. It was like 500 birds. It was terrifying because I, I was, <laughs> I had a major phobia of birds. And so when I finally got to his head, it was a, it was a freaking bird head. And, and thank goodness I'd had that experience because that would have really terrified me. Uh, and uh, well, did it look like those hieroglyphic type of drawings yeah. where it's like a human with a bird head? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was essentially, and I, I, I so Robin uh, asked me to ask if that was uh, like to ask its name, and he was trying to talk to me because uh, I wanted to know, I wanted to know who it was. Um, I wasn't very familiar with, uh, like gods or anything, uh, like especially Egyptian. And, uh, so he, he's trying to talk to me, but I can't hear him. And, uh, he, so I get told, I, I'm like, I'm like, I can't hear you. And so he tries, he points to my head and he starts, he does something to adjust me, but it's really painful. So I tell him to stop. And so he stops. And then he starts miming things and he, he, uh, I got, I was able to get Ra out of it. So like RA, so the Egyptian God. And, uh, he ended up le uh, leading me, uh, over to this giant, it's almost like minority port. So it was like a clear plastic chalkboard essentially. And he started drawing these things like, uh, like a, like a giant circle and then a little dot. And then he drew a line and I had to, since I couldn't understand him, I was like, oh, I need to, I need to ground myself. And he's like, he did like a double thumbs up. He was pretty funny, actually. Uh, and uh, there was a bunch of people kind of lazing, uh, like s lazing around on the sand and they all started clapping for me. <laughs> like, it's like a pretty, pretty simple thing to guess, but they were pretty, they were impressed that or, or at least humoring me maybe. And, uh, and then I turned into a child again. So like there's these themes throughout the, all these different experiences, which is interesting. Um, I turned to a child and uh, he grabs my hands and we float up into uh, the galaxy, not like unlike your um, background there. And there's all, and we keep zooming out and zooming out until there's the galaxies are like this, like this big, they're all around us. And he grabs one and he compresses it into a ball and then he hands it to me. And then I ask, like, what is this? And I didn't realize at the time that I had started understanding him. Um, it was only after that I started, as I was uh, recounting and stuff that I realized that I could actually understand him at this point. And he says, oh, this is for later. Um, now, when I do my meditations, that turns out to be what I use. Uh, I picture as my energetic self is so for when I'm doing a meditation and I'm trying to examine um, my energy that that's what I picture. And it started off cloudy when I first started. And now it's like a perfectly white sphere, which is what he had handed to me. Um, and so then, uh, we float back down 
and he leads me over to a pyramid. So we walked down and the sun had been like golden and high in the sky. And as we walked around this little hill, it became dusk. And then it turned into like these purplish color, kind of like um, Aladdin when uh, they find the tiger cave. Uh, it was one of my favorite cartoons as a kid. And so it was all purples and stuff. So we go inside this uh, this pyramid and there's this giant, and it look, it's way bigger inside than it was on the outside. And uh, there's this giant um, statue there. And I can't see the head, but it's obviously an Egyptian statue, but it's in the position of Abe Lincoln's statue. So it's sitting like in a chair with his hands like this. And he leads me over and he sits me down and he tell he gets me to sit in a special position and gets me to do this with my hands, which now I've learned is a mudra. So there's different hand positions for meditation that uh, allows you to that's supposed to uh, do certain things. So this particular mudra is for intuition and for your throat chakra to allow you to be able to speak more um, because I had trouble speaking. And uh, he tells me to sit down and do this special type of breathing, which is like a rapid in, uh, inhalation and exhalation until you start getting dizzy. And then you start floating out of your body. Uh, I, I later researched it, and that turned out to be uh, holotro uh, holotropic breathing uh, by that started with Stanislav Graf. Um, so then uh, I stand up and... Uh, he says, uh, he, he grabs me and he gives me a hug and he, and I start bawling and I was bawling, you know, like, like not just in the, the hypnotherapy, but like physically too, it was just like bawling my eyes out. Cause he was saying he was how proud he was of me and stuff. It was a very, uh, cathartic and emotional, uh, moment. And then he leads me into this other area of this pyramid and it ended up being this golden tree trunk with roots on the ground. And it ended up leading up into this giant library. And every branch went to different levels of this giant library. And they were, you, you'd get on them. They're almost like an escalator without any steps, almost like in an airport, right? So you get on and you zip up to whatever layer. And he brings me up and I end up, uh, he pulls out a book and he holds it open. And he's like, this is your book. And it was, it was mid sentence. He's like, you still have to finish it. And he closes it and he puts it back. And then he, uh, we start, we jump on the tree, tree escalator. And I asked him about, I felt like I needed to ask him about Atlantis for some reason. And I said, is this connected to Atlantis? And he like Egypt and Atlantis or something. And, uh, he pulls out this red thread and he goes, it's, it's connected. And that's all I got. I still don't know what that means. <laughs> Did you learn what the purpose of the pyramids are? I wish. Yeah. Yeah, I wish. Uh, yeah, no, I didn't get anything useful other than for myself, <laughs> <laughs> which I guess is useful too, right? Um, and so then we started uh, going downwards and we end up in this white room. So similar to my UFO, but I had actually created this room in one of my meditations where I'd fall off. A, I'd picture myself floating on the surface of the water, like in Hawaii. And I'd fall off the back of the fall backwards onto the, into the water from a surfboard. And I'd uh, sink all the way down to the, the bottom of the ocean. And I had been doing that for weeks. And like, it felt really, really good to just like, uh, just like fall down and uh, end up at the bottom of the ocean. It just felt really peaceful and spontaneously a doorway appeared one time and this was after weeks of doing it i uh, so i entered it and there, there's this white room um so it kind of was like my the white room from my childhood and so i go in there and i i was realizing i could put stuff in there so i'd be able to i put up a bookshelf with books on it uh that were one for every year of my life and i don't know why i did it and then i put up put two chairs and then I started putting in things like things I wanted. So like, like I wanted a Corvette or uh, a really big house or winning the lottery, all this different stuff and, and uh, like traveling, all that stuff. And so anyway, so uh, Ra leads me back into there 
and he walks over to all the material things and he wipes them away. <laughs> and I had been locked out of that room for months. So at one point I had been locked out um, of my own mind, which I thought I thought was really weird. Uh, I had walked in there the one the last time and there was something there waiting for me. And then the door slammed and I got kicked out of my own meditation, um, which was really weird. Uh, so anyway, so Ra, I'm in there with Ra. And he wipes them all away and he decides to light a, a cigar while I'm waiting and tells me to go look around and stuff because he's added some things. Uh, he's a pretty funny, funny, pretty funny dude. And um, there is this outline of myself sitting in the position, like a, in this lotus position with the, my mudra. And it was like an outline, almost like if you're playing a video game, it's like a ghost car. And, uh, and there was this arrow pointing to it and it was like flashing. Like, okay, this is where I'm supposed to go meditate. And he nods. And and then uh, there's a, he made a desk with my, that book he showed me that I can write in. Uh, I ended up writing like uh, um, later on, probably months later, I ended up going back in there and writing like, like you're enough and like some nice like things to say about myself. Right. Um, and so then he, uh, he, he says, okay, you've, you figured it out. And he gets up and he, he, there's a list that appears on the side of the door. And it's all these things I'm supposed to do. And there was five things, but uh, only four were showing. So there was like, eat healthy, don't worry about body image, uh, do yoga. And then it's skip number four. And then the last one was uh, meditation. And he leaves and I'm standing and left there standing there. And it's this list of one to a hundred. And I'm trying to, I'm looking at this. I like, obviously I have to think of what number four was. And then I realized um, part of like the meditation was I'm, the goal was to do these out of body experiences. And uh, so I end up, um, so I was like, oh, out of body experience. And then it fills in. And, <laughs> and then this giant lettering pops up in the middle of the room that says achievement unlocked. So, which was really funny. <laughs> And, uh, and so then I, I was sitting there not really knowing what to do. And then I started zooming out, zooming out, zooming out. And I ended up seeing like my, my particular white room and as I kept zooming out, zooming out. And then I could see all these other ones all across the earth. And some of them were full and some of them were empty. And there's, uh, and I kept zooming out until I couldn't see the earth and then the galaxies. And then all of a sudden I was in this white space. And it was completely white, uh, pretty much like every TV show when they show them like in the afterlife or like in like TNG is a really good example. Like it's just like this white nothingness uh, and with a white floor. And there's this uh, I look around and there's this little girl that looks like a doll. And she turns around and she's only about like this tall. She turns around. And she's like, what are you doing here? And I was like, I don't know. She's like, you're not supposed to be here. And then I felt this most intense pain uh, I've felt. And I, I was like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be out here. And then my hypnotherapist is like, she's like, there's a doorway. Just go through the doorway. And I look and there, a doorway appears and I go out the doorway and, and then uh, end up back in my, my room. And Ra comes swimming by and he gives me the double thumbs up. And then uh, I was done. Well, in the beginning, I mentioned that your YouTube channel is called Our Collective Experiences. Mm -hmm. On your channel, do you talk about this stuff? Yeah, so I'm on uh, episode two. I'm about to do episode three, and I like to do um, pictures as well. So I'm using Mid Journey a lot to really describe, not just with words, but how it feels visually. Mm -hmm. um, and so my first episode was my, about my NDE. My second episode was about uh, my mom's uh, experiences as well as that first UFO. And then this next episode uh, is going to be about my uh, a post-apocalyptic dream that I had um, right after. That ended up, my dad ended up, ha so mine stopped and then my dad's, my dad continued it, which was super, at the time I thought I was going really crazy. Um, and uh, and then also my, my experience as a four-year-old. And I'm eventually going to work up to like all I'm trying to do it almost like a um, like a chronological order of how I explored everything. 
Um, because, uh, like as an experiencer, uh, you do feel like you're going crazy and it's really tough. It's like super tough going through it. Cause you don't know if you're going crazy or if there's anybody else that's ever had an experience like this. Um, and so the things that helped me the most was knowing that there was others that have had experiences like this. And so my whole goal is to pay it forward essentially and be able to talk about my own and take away some of the stigma and shame because there's a lot of stigma and shame associated with um, if you say anything, NDEs are pretty acceptable. And even that some people have trouble with, but anything anomalous, then people start thinking you're like a wacko and everything, but I'm, I'm really well, I'm doing way better now than I was before this. So, so, uh, like I had, uh, I was diagnosed with uh, borderline personality disorder. I don't have any of, and they said it would take me like 15 years to get over the, some of the symptoms. Um, I don't have any of the symptoms anymore. Hmm, that's great. Um, by, by doing, uh, like a, like working on myself and stuff, but, uh, yeah. Well, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Should they do that by leaving you comments on your YouTube videos, if you're up for it, yeah. or emailing yeah. you? Or? Yeah, with, uh, so my YouTube channel has an email, um, and it's right in the show notes. And so if anybody wants to contact me, I'd love to talk to anyone uh, who's had any type of experience. Um, and eventually the whole entire goal is that uh, through sharing and creating like a, almost like a safe space, just like your channel, um, specifically geared for uh, experiencers or anybody that's open and curious, uh, from somebody that is an experiencer that they can talk to me. Um, I have lots of resources like of uh, sometimes like when you're first getting realizing your experience, you don't know where to turn or what, uh, like it, where's the support you can find. There's lots of support on online. So like Reddit has uh, the experiencer r slash experiencers. There's like 40,000 members now. Hmm. of of experiencers uh there's the um the experiencer group uh online that it has um actual support meetings and everything for experiencers um a, a lot of us have ndes like it's a high percentage it's a very high percentage uh so we end up uh and being able to talk in a non-judgmental uh, space so just like with you like i feel like i can talk here and I'm not going to be judged. And that's a really important, that's a really important factor. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Uh, if you're feeling lost right now, uh, like if you're lost in this, in a storm and you feel like you don't know where to turn, uh, the storm will pass. And on the other side of the storm is uh, a beautiful sunny meadow. It's, uh, even if you feel like you'll never get out of something, um, you will. Sean, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I uh, really enjoyed it and thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.